Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our live webinar on index tracking portfolios here at IB Asset Management. Uh, my name is Joe Sullivan. I'm a director uh, out of Boston for Interactive Brokers um, Asset Management, and it's a pleasure to be joined by Rolf Agather. Uh, he's a main director and head of North American Research, and he is based out of Seattle. Um, <clears throat> Rolf's responsibilities is leading the FTSE Russell team that creates new index con uh, concepts and publishes compelling research on capital markets. Um, so we are going to introduce to you guys our brand new index tracking portfolios with IB Asset Management partnering uh, with FTSE Russell. Ralph's going to discuss an overview of FTSE Russell and highlight two of the indices that we are tracking. I'm then going to break down how we've constructed these models, how to buy them. Uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A and you should be able to during this webinar at any time ask a question into the question box on your webinar. So we're very pleased and excited to announce the launch of these 13 models to our platform here at IB Asset Management. Um, these 13 portfolio strategies seek to passively track the FTSE Russell Index. Um, the 13 portfolios will span asset classes such as U.S. equity sectors, U.S. equity dividend growth, U.S. market caps, mega caps, and real estate investment trust. So really, the, the pillars, the benefits of these strategies are low fees, industry low 20 basis point annually, uh, full transparency as we utilize SMA structure, so you're able to see these positions and trades online in your dashboard at any time, as well as your brokerage account. Um, we use fractional shares, so we're able to keep um, a very, very low minimum and diversify these products. The minimum is actually $5,000. Um, ease of buying, full liquidity during the trading day, uh, and of course, you can buy and sell these online as you can any of our other portfolios. Uh, and we actually rebalance these into your account directly every quarter. So I'm going to pass it over to Rolf here. Uh, again, Rolf, the head of North American Research at FTSE Russell. He's going to break down the indices, um, two of these models that we are tracking, the dividend growth and the technology, both um, Russell 1000s. All right, thanks, Joe, and thanks to everyone for taking the time to listen in on this webinar today. <clears throat> We're obviously very excited to be working with interactive brokers on, on these products. And I think it's interesting because while people may be familiar with indexes and understand you know, some elements of past investing, I don't think people are always aware of how much um, indexes are used throughout the investment process. So before getting into the product, I thought it would be interesting just to talk a little bit about FTSE Russell and how we really play a part in, in the entire investment management industry. Um, one of the things we actually track is we know how many assets are actually being benchmarked to one or more of our indexes. So you'll notice here on, on this slide that over $12 trillion right now of investment assets are either benchmarked to a FTSE Russell index, whether that's U.S. equity, fixed income, or global equity, as well as assets that are actually directly tracking the indexes, such as the products we'll talk about today. So an example here would be if you were to go out and look at a mutual fund uh, on, on a particular example, um, and you would see that the benchmark being used for that actively managed strategy would be a Russell index, um, potentially. Of, of that 12 trillion, then about 3 trillion is actually where we do have assets directly tied to an index, uh, potentially in a number of vehicles. You'll notice that 500 billion of that 3 trillion is actually an ETF, and the remainder then would obviously be in other separately managed uh, products or mutual funds and, and other things like that. Um, we actually have a fairly strong institutional heritage, so I actually came from the Russell Investments Organization, where we obviously dealt with a lot of large institutional investors, and one of the other statistics we track is about three-quarters of uh, institutional equity assets uh, in the U.S. are actually benchmarked to, to a FTSE Russell index. So, you know, we're a bit behind the scenes in a lot of cases. People may not be as aware of, of where indexes are used and where FTSE Russell actually plays a part. So these numbers definitely give you a great idea of that. And, and as a result, you can see just the, the number and types of organizations that we work with. So we're being used by the top five global custodians, the top 10 investment banks, you know, most of the largest plan sponsors and asset managers um, around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes. So it's actually a big responsibility, right? And so I think because we recognize that there's so many assets tied to the indexes in some form, um, we, we have very strong governance and operational processes. So we have a number of external and internal committees who are overseeing all the methodologies and changes to the methodologies in the indexes. Uh, one of the things we'll, we'll highlight a number of times today, there's, there's a lot of transparency with indexes and products based on the indexes. And so part of that transparency is the governance process. You know, we actually 
publish the notes of, of the, the meetings and, and people can understand if there's changes being made to the indexes, why those changes were being made. Uh, I represent the research groups. So I think obviously uh, in today's world, it's important to continue to innovate. So a lot of our research is done around looking at new ways of investing, but also you know, looking at traditional ways and helping educate the investors about you know, what these products do, how the indexes behave. A uh, big part of my job is, is doing these sorts of presentations, hopefully to educate investors on how to better use these types of products. And through uh, a number of acquisitions, you know, FTSE Russell is actually in a very unique spot where, you know, today we're just going to talk about the equity products, but we do have a variety of indexes that cover other asset classes, in particular, you know, fixed income, real estate, and currency. So we think as, as all investors really are, are multi-asset in nature, you know, as an index company, we have a, a quite a number of different products that we can use to support those types of, of investment activities. So that's just a little bit of background on the FTSE Russell organization and how indexes are used. So just wanted to look at uh, some of the individual uh, indexes that are used to, to underlie the products we'll be talking about today. Before I get into the individual ones, I think it's also important to highlight that um, for the most part, these indexes are based within our Russell 3000 U.S. index family. So many people are, are probably familiar with the Russell 2000, which does get reported uh, in the media from time to time. It's, it's currently you know, considered the leading barometer of small cap performance in the U.S. But the Russell 2000 is actually part of a broader family. So the Russell 3000 index, which is basically the 3000 largest stocks in the U.S., um, represents about 98% of the U.S. market. And so this index has, you know, been around since the 80s. It's got about 40 years of, of history. And we can use that broad market index as a way of constructing other more narrow segments of the market or different kinds of strategies, such as the ones we're going to talk about today. So as we look, you know, the products that are based on the Russell 1000, the, the Russell 1000 is the largest 1000 stocks out of the 3000. And then again, the familiar Russell 2000, which today we're not talking about any of those types of products, would be the 2000 smallest stocks in the U.S. So the real, I think, one of the key highlights that I like to talk about with the products based on these indexes is the investors now have, you know, the ability to get more specific exposures and to take really more control of their portfolios in a very transparent way. So if you think about the traditional ways of, of thinking about making investment decisions, investors had generally two choices. You could decide to invest passively in the broad market and basically accept whatever the market did. You know, that's the definition of passive management. Or you could make a decision to delegate to an active stock picker in the hopes that that stock picker could beat the market or, or offer you some sort of other uh, investment objective. But that was really the, the two choices you had in the traditional active passive spectrum. Uh, nowadays, obviously, what we're doing now is putting more precision and more control in the hands of the, the end investor. You can now use products like this to capture the best of both worlds. So these, these, the indexes that we're going to be talking about today you know, are, are, they're, they're passive in the sense that they're very transparent, they're very rules-based, you know, any investor can go out to our website, they can see the underlying construction rules of these products, they can look at the, the holdings, they can see a lot of analytics, but again, they're very precise tools. You, the investor, now have the ability to focus on a particular part of the economy if you want, or you can, you can choose a particular strategy and, and deliver a, an outcome. So just to talk about some of the specific indexes, as Joe mentioned, um, the, the products are based on nine equity sectors within the U.S. And, and again, so every company in the Russell 1000 is, is included in one, one of these sectors. So this, if you were to look at the sectors in aggregate, that would represent the entire market. And so what's interesting here is, you know, if you're an investor, you do have the ability to potentially construct a core portfolio. You, you could choose to aggregate the products based on these, these sector indexes and, and come up with a, a fairly complete market picture. And you would have the ability to, to weight the, the sectors in, in your own configuration. You, you may wish to equal weight um, the sector products as a way of creating a core exposure without letting one sector dominate um, any, any of your portfolio. Or alternatively, you could be more tactical. You could decide that you want to overweight or underweight a particular sector and, and, and use that as a much more tactical play. The key here is that, again, these indexes are very transparent, they're very rules-based, they allow you to have access to a particular segment of the market. And we'll talk in a little bit more detail about one of these particular sectors in a moment. Next, I think we also have some unique strategies around dividends. So the, the two dividend growth products, one based on the Russell 1000 large cap stocks and the other based on the Russell 3000 broad market, 
uh, really try to give access to companies that have shown a consistent ability to pay dividends over time. So starting with the, the starting universe like the Russell 1000, we would look for companies that have consistently increased their dividend over a 10-year period um, with some sort of constraints on sector weight. And so the idea here is, you know, a lot of investors have been looking for yield. I think in the last few decades, we've, we've been in a low yield environment, um, especially in the fixed income side. And so I think investors have looked to equity markets and dividend paying companies as a way of, of hoping to increase the yield on their portfolios. Now, one of the issues you get into is potentially the reason you can get a higher yield on a company is, is not necessarily for the best reasons. There, there's reasons why, you know, the price of a company may be depressed, that, you know, it may be going through a particularly difficult time or there may be some advanced news that, that the market is aware of, which is causing that yield to be high. So there's, there's potentially an issue with simply looking at companies that pay high yield. So the idea behind the dividend growth index is that, you know, we, we're looking for more consistency uh, of companies that have shown an ability, you know, through increasing cash flows and through a consistent dividend policy that, that have paid dividends. So even though these products aren't specifically seeking higher yields, they ultimately do have a bit higher yield than the market and we, we have that, that safety and consistency of the, the growing dividend payment. So again, both of these strategies are available, one on the large cap segment of the market and the other on the, the broader market, the Russell 3000. The remaining two strategies uh, focus even more narrowly uh, on, on different segments of the market. So the Russell Top 200 is the top 200 companies within the Russell 1000. So this is really the mega caps of the, the U.S. economy. So this is the, the Alphabets and the Microsofts and the Facebooks um, of the world. And it's not just technology, right? You'll see energy companies, you'll see um, healthcare companies in the top 200. But again, these are really the big mega cap companies, uh, you know, what, what traditionally would have been called the blue chips. So the Russell Top 200 Index is really going to identify the, the biggest companies in the U.S. market. And then we also do have you know, the ability to access through the equity markets uh, uh, you know, the real estate asset class. So the FTSE NARI All Equity REIT Index uh, basically contains all tax qualified REITs in the U.S. Um, it's rebalanced quarterly, and the idea here is, you know, it does give you the ability to get exposure to real estate through a REIT-type vehicle. So these are the indexes that underlie the actual portfolios. Um, what I thought I would do is then just highlight, you know, some of the transparency issues um, for a couple of the indexes. But before we do that, um, I think it's important to, to go over a, a disclaimer. So if you think about the assets that are under management that are tracking indexes, those are, you know, managed by organizations like, uh, interactive brokers, we at FTSE Russell really don't run any money. So um, all of the information I'm going to provide on the next couple slides are dealing only with the index. And it's important for investors to recognize that while that information, you know, is definitely useful and is something you can, can look to as a way of making decisions about your, your portfolio, that that information is not necessarily reflective of actual investment products. So, so everything I'm going to talk about in the next two slides is really dealing specifically with indexes. It's generally indicative of the type of experience we've seen in these particular areas of the market, but again, is not um, reflective of an actual portfolio. So just looking at some additional information on the dividend growth index, and I think what we're really trying to highlight here is the transparency you get when you use products based on indexes. So you're actually able to get a lot of information on the underlying constituents, um, you can look at things like, in this case, on the dividend growth index, we can look at the dividend yield. So you can actually compare the dividend yield of, of one product versus another or the broad market. Um, you can see, in this case, because we equal weight the stocks, you'll notice that the weights in the, the top 10 constituents are roughly the same. Um, one of the reasons they're not exactly the same is we, we rebalance the indexes on a quarterly basis. And after a rebalance, as the market moves, companies have different performance and their weight can be slightly different simply because as companies perform differently, some will take up more weight in the portfolio and some will take up less. But generally, you should expect an equal weighted index like the Russell 1000 dividend growth to, to have roughly equal weights across securities. So in this case, no one security is really going to dominate this portfolio. Again, the idea here is these are companies that have been able to pay consistent growing dividends for the last 10 years. And so the idea is you want to have an equal exposure to all of those types of companies. You know, and another type of information, again, that investors, you know, always want to look at is, is looking at performance. And here's where, you know, there's a benefit to being able to look at the index performance as a proxy when you do not have a live track record. So, you know, again, with my comments that these don't reflect actual portfolios, this information is very indicative of the types of experience we've seen in the indexes 
um, as we've calculated the history uh, in the past. So just looking at some historical total returns uh, for the Russell 1000 Dividend Growth Index, uh, one of the things you can see is that you know, over a longer period, in this case 10 years, that the Dividend Growth Index has had you know, a little bit better performance than the broad market as measured by the Russell 1000. Now in shorter periods, when we've had some fairly strong bull markets, you'll notice that in the one-year example, um, the dividend growth may have underperformed. Looking at the calendar years, you'll notice that there are going to be always going to be years where a particular strategy like the dividend growth index might outperform or underperform. Um, but in general, you would expect a bit more consistency from a, a dividend growth type product. And in fact, you might find, as in the case of, of calendar year 2008, you know, dividend growth companies actually did a little bit less worse than the market. So in an environment where the broad equity market was down about 40 percent, you would have seen that these dividend growth companies were actually only down about 30 percent. So at least on a relative basis, you as an investor were better off, even though it was difficult to find companies that would have had even positive performance in that environment. Conversely, if you look at more recent experience, so 2017 was a very strong year for the equity market. So the Russell 1000 was up 38 percent. The dividend growth strategy was you know, only up 17.5. So still a fairly healthy positive return, but on a relative basis, um, it did underperform the market. And for some investors, this is this is what they want. That you know that if they're more risk averse, they you know they they still can get exposure to the equity markets, but potentially take less risk than the broad markets. And you know while they may underperform during strong bull markets, they potentially have the ability then to you know outperform when the markets go down or or are basically flat. So again, this is just an example of the types of ways that investors can think about using a product based on an index like the dividend growth index. The next focus index is the Russell 1000 Technology Index. So obviously we've got nine you know, products based on the sector indexes. Rather than go through each of them, I, I just thought we'd highlight the Technology Index and you can use the same idea with this or other, other segments of the market. Um, so the idea here is you're able to get access to a very specific segment of the market. If you look at the top 10 constituents, you'll see again, very familiar names. Uh, you can see they're you know, fairly you know, healthy weight of this particular sector is in some of these very large companies like Apple and Microsoft. Um, you'll notice that um, you know, basically 67% of the weight of this sector index is in these large names. So it's important to recognize that, you know, as I mentioned, that you, know, you're, you really want to make a, a, an investment in a specific segment of the market. This is the type of index or the product based on this index will give you that ability to access the market. Now, obviously, technology is a, a fairly volatile area of the market. If you look at the historical returns, um, you'll see that technology has actually done very well, not only over the last 10 years on a longer term basis, um, but it's actually done you know, good in, in the more recent one year period. You know, technology does tend to be a growth sector. So for investors who potentially want to get more exposure to growth companies, you know, technology, the technology sector can be a way to do that. If you look at calendar year performance, so it can be a bumpy ride. I think, you know, again, as you look at 2008, when markets were generally down about 40%, technology actually went down on a relative basis a little bit more. So in, in investing, you know, we still like to say there's no free lunch, right? That, you know, potentially you can invest in some of these areas of the market and over long periods achieve higher returns, but potentially the cost of that is, is there's going to be some risk along the way. Um, but again, the idea here is that, you know, you've got this sort of information in hand you can look at. We publish these sorts of returns and this sort of information on our website. So investors have full access to all the information they need uh, about the, the results of the, the index performance. They can look at the construction and methodology and use that to help make decisions about how they want to invest. So with that, I'll, I'll just uh, stop talking about the indexes and turn it over to Joe to talk Great. a little bit more about the product. Absolutely, yeah. And um, so obviously these are all now listed into our marketplace. So if you want to learn more um, about these products, uh, you can look directly at ibkram.com or ibassetmanagement.com um, to find these strategies. It's important to note that these strategies are available uh, directly to clients um, and you can buy it as an advisor, advisor clients um, as well. So the first thing you would do on our website is simply go to the investment portfolios tab and then we have uh, highlighted at the bottom there uh, the index tracker. Once you click that, um, it would bring you to the portfolio summary page where all 13 are listed. Um, each summary page will have the allocation, um, sell discipline, performance, holdings, uh, and latest transactions. These are available not just to uh, clients that are current clients to IB Asset Management, um, but for potential clients as well. They're always visible online. 
So the way we've um, attacked the portfolio construction here is we run these models using a separately managed account structure. Um, that way the client has full transparency into the holdings um, and it's held directly in their name in their brokerage account, which differs in a great deal from a mutual fund or an ETF that typically um, gives quarterly reports on, on each holding. Um, we do a quarterly rebalance, so we actually make the trades on your behalf directly into your account for you. We're able to utilize fractional shares, um, which keeps the minimums to a low 5,000. Uh, and again, the full transparency online of your performance for the minute um, in each portfolio you're holding is quoting um, trades that have happened in your account. So really the goal of these portfolios, um, they're designed to follow certain predefined rules so that the portfolio can track the specified basket of underlying investments from the reference index, as well as um, talking about. Um, we aim to track the performance of the underlying basket of the index, um, and typically this would be in the form of passive investing. The index composition and quarterly rebalancing data is obtained uh, under a license agreement that we have with FTSE Russell, and the quarterly reconstitution of the underlying index is again mirrored directly into your account. Um, and I think it's really important to mention again, by utilizing fractional shares, we're able to offer these um, in fully liquid diversified portfolios at a very low minimum. So here we have um, some more disclosures. And uh, again, it's, it's important um, to note that the methodology used to create the, the indices will um, can, re can result in these portfolios achieving high or even positive returns. Um, while we at IB Asset Management aim to track the performance of the indices for these portfolios as closely as we possibly can, uh, we can make no guarantee that um, we would succeed in doing so, and the factors may adversely affect portfolios, typically um, correlation, reference indices, fees, transactions, disruptions, illiquidity markets, and securities for which the portfolios invest. So now we will um, turn it over to the questions that we have here for Rob and I. Um, so let's just queue those up. Got a quite a few here, which is great. Um, so the first question here is, uh, what is the difference between a mutual fund uh, or ETF um, compared to the IB Asset Management Tracker Portfolio? So a great question. I talk, touch on this a little bit. I think there's really three main factors here when dealing with an SMA versus an ETF or mutual fund. So most mutual funds um, charge low fees, low fees, have expense ratios, management fees, um, and trading costs are typically rolled up into the performance uh, of the vehicle. Where our models only charge a annual, one annual uh, management fee and trading commissions, which are you know industry so low standard, utilizing IB and utilizing the fractional shares. Uh, also transparency, right? So like I mentioned, funds only disclose holdings on a quarterly basis. Uh, all of our clients that invest in these portfolios can see the underlying um, holdings at any time uh, in real time data uh, of trading and performance. Uh, and lastly, and this is important as well um, as we head into tax time, um, a lot of these ETFs and mutual um, funds typically have embedded capital gains uh, that you as the individual holder may have not experienced, where if you're investing in SMA, uh, the capital gains and the tax experience is really of your individual holdings and positions. Um, the markets have been volatile recently. Which indices have an outcome to address volatile markets? So, uh, what Rolf thinks of that one? Yeah, and again, I think it's a great question, and, and one of the circumstances that you know we as investors face. Uh, I can't give specific recommendations, but I think you know to refer back to some of my earlier comments. You know, this is where you know you as an investor now have the ability to employ your own strategy about how you might you know handle volatility. So, like I mentioned, if you think about the, the sector products, you know, that all companies in the market are, are represented in those sectors. Um, we know that some sectors are, are, you know, more defensive than others, like utilities um, or, or more cyclical and so, or financials. And so, you know, potentially this is where as an investor, you can start to think about, you know, what sort of sectors do I potentially want to start overweighting as a way of being more defensive? The idea here is you have the ability looking at a sector type framework to think about, you know, how you might take a more defensive posture. I also highlighted that, 
you know, there is some bit of stability to the dividend growth products, right? While they're not necessarily going to, you know, generate a positive outcome when markets are down, you will find that potentially, you know, negative experience is dampened simply because, you know, we know that these companies have continued and, and are expected to continue to pay, you know, a consistent dividend over time. So even though markets might be volatile, might go up and down, you know, these companies, you know, continue to, to pay, you know, dividends and, and uh, it's been a fairly consistent process. So I think the idea here is, you know, without making a specific recommendation, is these are much more precise tools that enable you, the investor, to make your own decisions about how you want to deal with the market volatility. Great. Next question. Um, may an investor own multiple index tracker portfolios in one account? Uh, if yes, could a sector rotation strategy be implemented with the sector index portfolios? Um, I'll answer the first one. I'll let Ralph answer the second. So you can own on our website um, as many of these portfolios as long as the suitability and you, you're able to meet the, the minimums, which is really nice. Um, it, that's kind of the main benefit of our platform where you can have multiple SMAs, multiple managers running multiple different um, um, disciplines and allocations, and you're doing it in one singular account. Yeah, and I, again, back to the, you know, the example I, I talked about a little bit earlier, you know, even though there's, these are individual sector products, you know, to the extent, the, you know, the considerations that Joe mentioned, you could own, a, you know, or have a more strategic allocation across a more diversified set of sectors if you want, or you can be more tactical. You can decide you want to be over or underweight a particular sector, you know, even on a more rotational basis. So you do have the benefit to be both strategic and tactical when you've got these underlying components of the broad market. All right, great. Um, so that is, uh, we're going to cut it short there. Uh, thank you so much to Rolf for joining us here. Um, we're very, very excited to be partnering with FTSE um, and launching these 13 uh, portfolios out into the, to the marketplace. If there's any questions uh, that we didn't get to that you posted into the webinar, we'll follow up with you um, by, by email. You can reach me directly. There's my email. There's my phone number, joe at ibkram.com. Um, um, and uh, any and all information is obviously available on our website. So thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we will talk to you soon.